Hey everybody, this is Scott Denny with Family Tree Nuts, and today I'm in Deland, Florida with Mr. Rob Logston, and we're here to talk about his dad, a true American hero named Clarence Moore Logston. Hey Rob, how's it going? I'm doing wonderful. How about you, Scott? Doing great, doing great. Appreciate you doing this. Oh, this should be fun. <laughs> so, tell me a little bit about your daddy's military career. Well, first of all, he uh, was in a lot of the famous events of uh, World War II in the South Pacific. He was on the Doolittle Raid. He wow. He was at the Battle of Midway. He was at the Guadalcanal cam campaign. And, he, and finally, uh, the last big one was the Battle of Santa Cruz, which was also in the yeah. area of the Guadalcanal yeah. campaign. Well, I know that you've uh, got some stories to tell about each of those parts of his life, his military career, but uh, Tell me a little bit about him. Where did he grow up? What was he like? Well, my dad was born February 3rd, 1919 in Fairhope, Alabama. Beautiful little town on the eastern shore of Mobile Bay. And dad always said a kid could not have grown up in a better place. Mm -hmm. And uh, his dad was Walter Logston. Mm -hmm. His mother was Sylvia Bowen Logston. They originally came from Indiana yeah. down the Ohio River on a houseboat. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, his, her her dad, uh, John Bowen, was known as Captain John Bowen. He he was the captain of boats on the Ohio River. Uh -huh. But he brought the whole family, including his new son-in-law, down the river, to, down the Ohio to the Mississippi, and they made their way across to uh, the the eastern shore of Mobile Bay to the relatively new community of Fairhope. So it sounds to me like your family was a family of sailors in one way or another. They were certainly, uh, they were on the river a lot. And, uh, <laughs> that's how they made their living on the river. Yeah. And uh, Captain Bowen, he, uh, he had sons, uh, two of which became well known and important people in the, uh, the city of Fairhope. Mm -hmm. uh, he had Tom Bowen, mm -hmm. who became uh, one of the owners of the steamboats that uh, crossed the Mobile Bay, bringing supplies and people to Fairhope. He owned one of those bay steamers. Wow. Uh, and he also owned the casino out on the pier. Mm -hmm. the, the pier was kind of the, a focal point of Fairhope. And, uh, so Tom Bowen uh, ran the casino. He was actually an owner of it. Yeah. And uh, that's, it was like a dance hall and a uh -huh. restaurant, and it was a focal point for the town. And his brother, Mike Bowen, became uh, the mayor of uh, Fairhope. Fairhope? Yep. Wow. And uh, so they were, they were well known in the town. And my dad, and he was the youngest yeah. of nine. And he, he grew up, his whole childhood was right there in Fairhope. Right there in Fairhope. They, uh, his dad bought a farm in 52 acres. Yeah. Right there on the kind of the eastern side of, uh, of Fairhope. Right. And uh, they, they grew all kind of crops. And, uh, but when, he, when his dad got older, his health started to fade. They sold the farm and they bought 10 beautiful acres on the bay. That 10 acres today is the Fairhope Yacht Club. So um, maybe they should have kept that property, right? Well, the, <laughs> unfortunately, my grandpa, my dad's dad, yeah. he started a little a store down there by the bay, mm -hmm. and he would uh, sell supplies to the fishermen right. going out to fish in Mobile Bay. Right. And he would go down there about 3 in the morning, mm -hmm. and the fishermen would come by and buy supplies. And then about uh, seven o'clock, he would uh, lay down and take a nap. Yeah. Until breakfast. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, cool. they only owned the property for about a year. Yeah. And and m my granddad passed away. Yeah. And my dad actually went down there to get him for breakfast, and found him passed, Had passed away. away. So that was you know for an eight eight year old that was that was a, traumatic. That Had was a traumatic be. event yeah. in his life. You know? So. He grew up there. Tell me a little bit about his school days and what was it like growing up in Fairhope? It, it, 
it was a very small town back then, probably not much more than a thousand people mm-hmm. in, in the in, say in the twenties. Yeah, but it, it, it was growing, and uh, yeah, they actually went to the, the the kids that were still at home uh, went to uh, a private school, and it was uh, kind of famous. Yeah, uh, it was called Organic School, and it was started by a lady named Marietta Johnson, who was a Pretty famous uh, progressive educator, mm-hmm. and uh, Dad would always he went to school there from the third grade uh, on. Mm-hmm. And uh, there at that that little small school, he became uh, very well known for his athletic ability. So he's very athletic. Extremely, he, he was he was something of a a phenom as an athlete. Right, he played every sport. Mm-hmm. He, he he played football, basketball, baseball. He, he was on the swim team, diving. Mm-hmm. He, he played golf and tennis. Mm-hmm. He excelled at all of them. Well, I think you told me he had some, some uh, collegiate opportunities, but he chose the military instead. How did that happen? I mean, where did he, how did he get started in the military? Well, he, he, in, uh, after, after high school, yeah. uh, he, at about 18, he was going to join the military, the Navy. Mm-hmm. And uh, this would have been about nineteen what? Oh, this about. would have been 1938. Right before the war. There. Yeah, not too long before the war. Mm-hmm. And he went down and tested for the Navy mm-hmm. and passed. But at that time, just before the war, they didn't need so many people, and they told him he was going to have to wait, and it would probably be like six months. Yeah. And so, in the meantime, he uh, he went actually to a, a, a trade school. Mm-hmm. You know, a woodworking school to, to learn that as a trade, and while there, they had a ba- basketball team. Mm-hmm. This team from this little trade school played military bases and small colleges in the area. Yeah, and he was a star on this basketball team. Good enough that a University of Florida scout saw him play at the University of Florida. A university saw, a scout saw him play. Right. And uh, offered him a scholarship uh, to the University of Florida for basketball, despite him being five foot six and a half, and probably not more than 140 pounds. Well, it was a different game back then. <laughs> so he went on into the Navy, right? He did, uh, and also I should mention uh, during that time when he was a young man, from age 12 uh-huh. to about 16, he was a, a well-known amateur boxer. In, That's right. In both I'm glad you mentioned that in both Fairhope and in Pensacola. Mm-hmm. He, uh, he actually won 35 out of 36 fights. His lone loss was to the hometown favorite in Pensacola and lost a split decision. Mm-hmm. And, and that fighter actually came to him and said, he said, fella, you, you won the fight. You beat the devil out of me. And that fighter went on to the Golden Gloves regional tournament, tournament beat George Wallace, the future governor of Alabama, yeah, and ended up in the finals of the Golden Gloves. In wow, Chicago. what a story. Sounds to me like we're talking about a red-blooded American, alpha male, all-American boy here. A- absolutely. Yeah. He, he, you know, he, a, a lot of uh, the guys that grew up in that area, era, they, uh, you know, it was the Depression era, that was tough on almost everybody of that yeah. time. And a lot of those guys went on to a fight in World War II. So that mm-hmm. part is not all that unique because there was millions of, right. of, of good right. red-blooded American boys, as you say, that went on and did that. Right. But what was unique for my father was those historic events that he was at once he joined the Navy and, uh, and went to war. I can't wait to hear about him. So, he went into the Navy. What happened? Where did he go? Well, he, he, went, he was trained in Norfolk, mm-hmm. 12 weeks of training in Norfolk. About 19... This would have been 1939. Okay. And uh, from there, he was picked to, to be on the ship, the USS Omaha. It was an old four-stack light cruiser, and uh, he was picked, selected for that. Dad was a quick study. 
he had, he had learned to pilot boats as a very young man. I mean, yeah. He was a 10 or 12 year old. Around Mobile piloting, Bay. Yeah. Piloting boats around Mobile Bay. Yeah. Because that's what the family did. Yeah. And uh, so that was something he had <laughs> in, in there that he already knew about. Mm -hmm. And uh, on, on the ship, he was uh, assigned to deck handling duties. It, but he, he learned a lot of things. Uh, he was also um, on the signal bridge. His, his battle station was on the signal bridge. And those are the guys that did the signaling with the mm -hmm. flags. Mm -hmm. And they also served as lookouts. And he did that on the Omaha. And so he was on the Omaha for about two years. Mm -hmm. when, and the Navy was getting ready to... Um, Kristen, the new aircraft carrier, USS Hornet, CV-8, as it was known. And uh, Dad was hand-selected by Captain Mark Mitcher, who became a famous World War II figure. Uh, Captain Mitcher uh, reportedly hand-picked the entire 2,200-man crew. Hand-picked them? Hand-picked them, went through all their records, and... And it may be one, the Hornet was known as a very happy ship, and that might be one of the reasons why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, folks, um, these stories are very important to our American history, and Russ and I really feel like that they need to be told. And uh, most of the people now who know about these stories are children of, of these, these World War II um, heroes. And... Uh, we at Family Tree Nuts think that's important. You know, you, you watch our videos, we do all kinds of historic videos, but we also think that these interviews are important so that these stories can be recorded forever right there on YouTube and they never go away. So if you're enjoying this, why don't you subscribe to our YouTube channel, Family Tree Nuts, and you'll see more interviews and historic videos like this uh, as time goes by because we've got plenty that we plan to uh, post soon. So anyway, back to your dad. Yeah. So he, w he was on the Hornet. Yes, and uh, this would have been uh, like October of 1941. And of course, in December 7th... Things are heating up. December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, pulled the sneak attack at mm -hmm. 0755 in the morning on, on uh, December 7th. Uh, the Where was he that morning? He would have been in, in North Still in Norfolk, Norfolk area. On that boat? Yeah, they were getting ready. They'd already been getting ready, put out for sea trials. Um, mm -hmm. They were not re quite combat ready yet. Boy, I bet they got combat ready quick. They they were put out to get it, get it ready <laughs> quick after the events of December 7th, 1941. Uh, so the, the Hornet was a what they call a Yorktown class carrier. So, so that, that would have been sister ships would have been Enterprise and Yorktown. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hornet would have been the last of that class. 800 foot long, 20,000 ton, about 2,200 men, carried about 80 warplanes. Correct me if I'm wrong, did I read somewhere that after the attack at Pearl Harbor, we only had three carriers fit to put to sea. Do you, do you, is that correct? And would this have it, been one of them? Well, it, it, as far as the South, the Pacific, yes. Okay. Uh, you, actually, there's probably there was uh, also um, the Lexington. That's right. So elsewhere there, in the world, there would have been four, and the Wasp would uh, soon join them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was in the Atlantic at the time, but mm -hmm. uh, it would soon be transferred to the South Pacific. The Enterprise and Yorktown and Saratoga and Lexington. That's right. Were, were in the Pacific. So I, I'm assuming they sailed to the Pacific pretty quick. Yes, well, what happened was, so they put out to sea and almost immediately uh, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, you know, we, we had defeats at Pearl Harbor and in the Philippines and, and throughout uh, Southeast Mm -hmm. the Pacific. And uh, so the military brass wanted to, they needed a win. And they needed something to make the, the people at home have faith that we were going to win this thing. 
So there was some Navy and Army brass that got the idea of attacking the Japanese homeland, which was going to be very difficult being an island so far away. You mean attack them from Hawaii? Well, that, that would have been impossible at the time. Right, because you did, you the Japanese attacked us from, from the deck of a carrier. From four carriers. And they snuck up on us. Exactly. So, so what did they, what did they plan well, to Well, they do? came up with the idea of, of using B-25 Army um, bombers. These are um, you know, more of a middleweight type bomber and because uh, they felt like they could take off from the deck of an aircraft carrier. With bombs on them and fully loaded? Yeah, they would have had like four or five hundred pound bombs. Wow, that's but, amazing. But it was going to be extremely difficult. It was going to take a lot of training to get these Army pilots to take off in about 600 feet or less. In the wind, with the wind. We turn into the wind and those, of course those carriers could go about 33 knots. And then mm -hmm. they turn into the wind, it would give them a uh, good lift to do that, but it's still bigger than anything that normally flies from the deck of an aircraft carrier. So they proceeded with this idea? Yep, they did. They trained at Eglin Air Force Base. They brought these B-25 crews. They didn't even know exactly what their, their mission was. They weren't told yet. Mm -hmm. And they trained at Eglin Air Force Base on how to tra take off mm -hmm. in 600 feet or less. Who was their commander? It was uh, Jimmy Doolittle. He was a famous Jimmy aviator. Doolittle. Jimmy Doolittle. Most people that know a little history of World War II have, have heard of Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle. So he was their leader. They were training at Elgin Air Force Base. Eglin. Eglin Air Force Base. How long? How long was it before they loaded up and headed to the South this, Pacific? This happened pretty fast. I think they started. They came up with the idea around February of 1942. And about a year later. No, 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 no months, two months later. This is months, just two months later. A couple months later. Right. So th this happened really in a matter of weeks that, that they trained for it. So uh, they, of course, they needed an aircraft carrier to deliver the, the planes. Uh, they wanted to get within 400 miles of the coast of Japan. And without they, being detected. Without being detected, which was going to be difficult. And so uh, what happened was that the Hornet, after all our sea trials were done, it proceeded uh, through the Panama Canal. With your dad on it. With my dad on it. He was on it from start to finish. Yeah. And they proceeded through the Panama Canal, around into the Pacific, to Alameda, uh, Oakland, Alameda area. Mm -hmm. California. Naval Air Station. Mm -hmm. And that's where they picked up 16... Mitchell B-25 bombers. Did your dad know it? Did, did he figure it out? What no, they were doing? No. You know, they probably, at that time, they probably thought they might have been ferrying some, you know, army bombers to somewhere. To somewhere, yeah. Yes. That's, that's probably what most people knew. But there was a little bit of buzz, so they weren't sure. Mm -hmm. So they, they loaded these 16 B-25s on the deck of the Hornet, and then they, they proceeded out uh, into the Pacific. The, the aircraft carrier Enterprise and their task force joined them and when they were a day at sea they were told what the mission was. That they were going to attack the Japanese homeland, Tokyo and other large industrial cities. So the entire group was going to sail within 400 miles of Tokyo oh, as a group? The entire, or the entire task force. The entire task force would, of ships. Would sail to within 400 miles that should give uh, the B-25s the range to fly the, to Japan, bomb the industrial cities, fly on to China, and land in small air fields there, mm -hmm. refuel, and take off again uh, for safer. So that was the plan? That was the plan. All right, but what about the day that they actually took off? Talk a little bit about that. Well, as, as they approached uh, uh, Japan, they got about 600, 650 miles uh, from the coast of Japan. Mm -hmm. And a Japanese picket boat, they, they, they had picket boats out there off the coast to warn the mainland of any approaching 
uh, enemy ships. So it looked like a fishing trawler or something like that. Mm -hmm. Just a, a smaller, you know, maybe a hundred foot long uh, picket boat, they would call them. Mm -hmm. And they actually saw the, the, our task force. They saw it coming. They saw it coming. Uh, our commanders didn't know if they had radioed in. Um, the destroyers and cruisers quickly uh, sank the boat. But it turns out they had alerted the Japanese homeland. Knowing that that was probable, Jimmy Doolittle ordered his flyers to get ready. They were leaving immediately. With barely enough fuel to get to China? Actually, or they didn't even know? They, it looked like they would not have enough to make it all the way to their planned locations. Because mm -hmm. they were taking yeah. off earlier, what, maybe 100 miles earlier than expected? Yeah, more like 200 200 miles, miles. yeah. So when they took off, did your dad see them go? Where was he? Well, his battle station w was up on the tower in the, the, where the, the signalman lookouts. He was the, actually the chief, that was his battle station, the chief uh, of the lookouts and signalman. I understand that he is was captured in a famous picture. He, he is depicted in one of the most famous uh, photos from uh, World War II. Tell me about that picture. Well, it, it, and here it is, by the most, way. It's in it's in most history books, mm -hmm. and it, and then it, it's a picture of Jimmy Doolittle's B twenty five, the first one off the deck, lifting mm -hmm. off. My dad is the uh, shorter man in the foreground of that um, lookout position. Leaning out over Leaning the railing. Out, yeah, he's the shorter man in the, in the front foreground of that picture. And that, that photo uh, uh, is in most history books. I can't think of any photo from World War II that's more famous than that one, except maybe... The Iwo Jima, Iwo Jima. flag raising mm -hmm. uh, would, would be one. Right. And, uh, and of course, of, of combat photos. And then maybe at the end of the war, the sailor giving the girl a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one too. Yeah, I've forgotten about that City, one. I so I would have to assume, I mean, he's at war now. The ships are taken off. I mean, the, the uh, planes are taken off. He's leaning over there. That picture is taken from somewhere in front of them on the ship. Uh, I wonder, how, did he even see that photo for, for a long time? Did he even know the photo existed? Uh, not till after the war. You know, it was actually a still from film. Oh, really? It was actually. Filmed. I think I've seen that film of that plane probably, going up. It, it shows the whole clip of the takeoff, and that became the famous still from the uh, film. Wow. That in itself is the story of a lifetime. He stood there and watched probably every one of those planes it go was, up. It was history. Yeah. It was history. So. Let's quickly kind of summarize what happened to the Doolittle Raiders, and then let's move on. Let's yeah. go back to your dad and talk about what happened Well, the, the Doolittle Raiders, the, the 16 planes, they all had different targets. So despite uh, Japan actually getting something of a warning, it wasn't all that effective because you had 16 planes coming in the coast in different areas. So there might be just one, one plane entering the you know to the airspace of the country right you know flying in low and uh, difficult to intercept so although um, some planes were intercepted by Japanese fighter planes mm -hmm. none of them were shot down uh, due to intercept right they, they pretty much all made their their run in dropped their bombs continued on towards China um, there was 80 men. In those planes? 80 men total in, mm -hmm. in the planes. Um, all the planes at some point ran out of fuel, crashed or crash landed. I believe three men were lost in crashes, perished in the, in the crash of the planes. Um, something like, I believe there was three that were captured and killed by the Japanese. All in in the territory of China because they had invaded China, right? They they were uh, they or were, yeah they had invaded China. China, the mainland. Yeah. They had invaded China, and some of them were captured. Captured. I, I think believe there was eight captured, 
three were executed. One died uh, of starvation, basically, and, and disease, and four, four uh, made it through, through the war. As in captivity. POW, yeah, as POWs. And then what and happened with the rest of them? The rest of them actually made, the, the, made it uh, to, into Chinese hands that got them back to the United States government. So they got back, they were handed back pretty quick. It's, in some cases, it took months. Really? It, it took months to actually get, get them, them out of there. Get them completely out of China and back right. in, in, in U.S. hands. It depended on where they crashed. And, right. You know, there was one crew that ended up in Russia. Oh, really? I they, didn't know that. They, they crash that. land in, in Vladivostok. Russia. Russia. And they were interned for a while in, in Russia and eventually released. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So the planes take off. He's still on the ship. Mm -hmm. Then what happened? Well, then the Hornet, uh, with that mission complete, they escaped out of there. Um, I bet they were moving quickly they were, to get out to they, get out of range. They, as soon as they launched them, they turned around and fled because they knew there was Japanese uh, submarines that were looking for them, and uh, so they immediately had Enterprise and Hornet headed to uh, Pearl Harbor and so made this, it, and they made it safely to mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor. So this would have yeah. been still in April of 1942. Okay. Uh, other battles would be coming up soon. The, um, the, really, the first aircraft battle of World War II was at Coral Sea, where Lexington and Yorktown uh, and, and Japanese carriers fought. Hornet, Hornet and Enterprise were not at that battle. They were on the way back. From, from Japan? From, yeah. Or from Japanese waters? From the Doolittle Raid. Yeah. So that, took, that battle, the Battle of Coral Sea, took place while they were transport them back. Yeah, that would that would have been in May. Okay. In May of 1942. Okay. So Hornet and Enterprise missed that battle. Right. Uh, they, they went back to Pearl Harbor. Uh, Lexington was sunk at Coral Sea and Yorktown was damaged. And uh, World War II buffs know that about this time uh, U.S. intelligence, naval intelligence, the code breakers had broken the Japanese code. They knew the next thing up for the Japanese, they were going to attack uh, Midway Island. And so we knew they were coming for Midway. We knew they were coming for Midway. And they were, they were going to plan, the, um, they, they sent four carriers, and, and of course they had another task force, and they were going to actually land and, and take the island with troops. Mm -hmm. We knew they were coming. So this, this would have been early June of 1942 is when the Japanese planned the Battle of Midway. So that's just a few weeks later. A few weeks later. So um, Hornet and Enterprise were at Pearl Harbor getting air crew ready for battle. Yorktown limped wow. into Pearl Harbor, was repaired uh, in like two days. Had wow. Her, had her flight deck repaired in two days. And uh, then they, they <clears throat> set sail for, uh, for Midway Island, and uh, they were set an ambush for the Japanese was the goal. So, the Battle of Midway. Yep, another great battle that my dad <laughs> managed to participate in. And, be and witness. And, and witness, yeah. Did he have any interesting stories about that battle? Well, yeah, he told me um, how, about their air crews and, and uh, how they uh, participated in the battle. And, of mm -hmm. course, um, very famous, um, the, the torpedo bombers off the Hornet. Torpedo Squadron 8 is a famous uh, squadron who flew these outdated devastator torpedo bombers to uh, attack the Japanese f fleet and the, the carriers on, uh, on that June morning. And uh, there were 16 of them. Mm -hmm. They flew off with the bombers and the fighter planes to try to intercept uh, the Japanese. Both Yorktown and Enterprise also uh, sent squadrons to attack. Mm -hmm. They d 
didn't know exactly where the Japanese were. They knew the general area, but they didn't. They knew that they had probably changed positions, and uh, their last known position was not known. Yeah. And uh, so, the commander of uh, Torpedo Squadron Eight was something of a rebel. He thought the flight leader of of the whole attack from Hornet was in error and was taking them the wrong way the to wrong find way. the Japanese. His name was John Waldron, and he actually ordered his flyers to follow his path, and they he took them right to the Japanese. That is documented in the movie called Midway. Midway. They, they sure is. Yeah. So they found the Japanese fleet. He, he took, straight as a string, John Waldron, took his flyers right to the Japanese carriers. And they attacked. They attacked, but they're flying these devastator torpedo bombers that are very outdated, slow. I mean, they couldn't fly more than 100 miles an hour carrying a, a torpedo. Right. So they were flying. They, of course, they had to come in on the deck. Right. Flying in. The Japanese um, Zero fighter planes caught them about 30 miles out. And just mowed them down. Mowed them down. Tore them. Only one uh, devastator made a run in. It got close enough to make him a run in and drop his torpedo. And that was Ensign Tex Gay of Texas. He made a run in. Uh, his gunner was dead. Mm -hmm. he, but he, he was wounded. He made a run in. Dropped his torpedo. He did not get a hit. He was then he was shot down by an aircraft fire, crashed about a half a mile from the Japanese carrier, and watched the whole battle, the rest of the battle from the water. Yeah, what? Uh, although it was devastating and and uh, tragic attack, unsuccessful attack. Mm -hmm. It served a purpose though. While the Japanese fighter planes were down on the deck attacking the, the devastator um, torpedo bombers. Then the uh, Yorktown and uh, Enterprise torpedo bombers came in. They were chewed up also. But right after that, the, the Japanese Zero fighters were out of fuel, they were out of ammunition, and they're down on the deck flying low and the uh, Dauntless Dive Bombers came in and saved the day. And in, in just a matter of minutes, won the, the Battle of Midway. So it was the third wave Basically. of Basically. military equipment that went in. Yeah. We got The first two waves got devastated. Yeah, the, the Torpedo Bombers, they lost almost all three uh, squadrons. Squadrons of they, those. Almost all of them were shot down. So you said they saved the day. What happened? Well, the, the, uh, the dive bombers, these dauntless dive bombers came in and these crew, these air crews planted several bombs on three of the Japan, three of the four Japanese aircraft carriers mm -hmm. while they were rearming and refueling planes. The, the resulting fires are what, what did, destroyed the, the ship and mm -hmm. started fires that was out of control. So they were trying to turn their, the Japanese were trying to turn their equipment around and get them ready to go, and we caught them off guard. We caught them off guard. They had been, they had been bombing Midway Island, but they needed to rearm and refuel For, mm -hmm. to attack ships. Because mm -hmm. obviously, knew that after getting attacked, they knew that we had carriers there. So your dad saw those planes leave the deck of his aircraft carrier, yeah. and then he probably saw the wounded ones come back. They sure did. They, the ones that made it. Yeah, and, and, and some of them, you know, they like, especially the fighter planes, um, they came back, shot up. Um, one of the Yorktown fighter planes, these were F4F Wildcats. One of them came in to land on Hornet, was not going to make it to his carrier, the Yorktown. He came in, crash landed, and either the jarring uh, of the crash landing set off his machine guns or he slumped over and hit the button and uh, I think 20 some of Hornet's uh, men were killed. They were on deck. Yeah, in, the, in that Horrible. accident. It's actually, 
the only gunfire that hit Hornet until the last day of her life some months later. Right. So that's the Battle of Midway. That was the Battle of Midway, which we destroyed all four uh, Japanese carriers. So that was the turning point in the war. That's considered the turning point of the war. Mm -hmm. it, it stopped the invasion in its track, and uh, they, they turned tail, basically, and run with uh, four carriers burning and getting ready to head for the bottom. Right. Um, so your dad's still on the Hornet. Now they're, they're recovering from the battle. Mm -hmm. Where did they go? What did they do? Well, uh, they returned to Pearl Harbor uh, after the battle. And, uh, and by July, August, they, um, they went and replenished their air arm because mm -hmm. they lost a bunch of planes. And um, th then they were sent to support uh, the Marines at Guadalcanal, uh, you know, where we were fighting the Japanese army on Guadalcanal, holding that little narrow strip of land. Right on the tip of the island. Tip of the island. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's some of the bloodiest battles of World War II. Right. Well, the Hornet and the Wasp were sent uh, to protect, provide air cover for the Marines at Guadalcanal. And uh, they bore the brunt of that for, uh, for months. And, uh, or I should say weeks, actually, mm -hmm. uh, protecting Guadal the Marines at Guadalcanal. So that was their next mission. That, that was the next mission, and from his, from his uh, duty station uh, up on the bridge, uh, from that signalman position, he watched uh, the USS Wasp, one of our fleet carriers, get torpedoed, catch fire, because as with the Japanese carrier, they were fueling fueling aircraft and got hit by a Japanese torpedo from a submarine and uh, it you know burned and, and had to be scuttled and uh, so that, that was a tragic event uh, that they had to watch. Mm -hmm. Also during this time a, a Japanese submarine fired torpedoes at Hornet and they were very lucky. A uh, an Avenger torpedo bomber pilot that had his aircraft, it, it had, instead of carrying a bomb, it had depth charges to take out submarines. He saw a wake heading for the Hornet. It looked like it couldn't miss. They had, they had evaded some other torpedoes, mm -hmm. but this one looked like it, it could not miss. And this quick thinking torpedo bomber pilot, he dove on the wake, he, later, he said he didn't know if it was a submarine or a torpedo, but he dropped his depth, depth charge, which either exploded the torpedo or, or disrupted it. Knocked it, it off course. Not possibly knocked it off course, and the Hornet was saved again. And I, I would say that uh, your dad and the men on the Hornet probably never knew that that was happening until it was already over. Actually, Dad witnessed that. Oh, so he saw it. He saw that. Yeah, he, he was up there, you know, on that, uh, on the bridge. Was your dad willing to tell these stories openly? Yeah, he, he was by the, you know, uh, these are stories I learned when I was, you know, six or eight years old. Mm -hmm. And by that time I'd already read. Read the books. I'd already read 30 <laughs> seconds of the, uh, over, uh, over Tokyo. You probably knew as much about the, about it as he did. <laughs> and he was there. <laughs> Not quite, but, but, I, but I knew it pretty well. Yeah. And, uh, and there was a book written about the Hornet back there right after the war. It's called A Ship to Remember. Mm -hmm. I pretty much knew that inside and out. I'll bet you did. Your daddy's on it. Yeah. So what happened next? Well, the, the next uh, Hornet uh, again went back to, to Pearl. And uh, then that, that area around Guadalcanal, you know, was a flashpoint. Mm -hmm. And the Japanese, you know, their, their ultimate goal was to try to strangle Australia and eventually take Australia. Mm -hmm. So the, the, uh, the Japanese, um, they were, they were going to attack Guadalcanal again. The Hornet and the Enterprise and their two task force were sent to the area near Guadalcanal called the Santa Cruz Islands. So this would have been the battle for the Santa Cruz Islands. About 19 what? 
This would be, it's still in 1942. Okay. Hornet, Soon. Hornet was only alive for one year and six days. And that was it. From October um, 6, 1941, till uh, you know, in October of 1942. Yeah. The, the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands. Mm -hmm. the Hornet and, and Enterprise and the two task force were sent to stop an invasion of, uh, of Guadalcanal again. And uh, Hornet and, and Enterprise, they didn't know the exact location of the Japanese, and the Japanese didn't know their exact location, so scout planes were sent out. And Inter an Enterprise scout plane found the Japanese, and Hornet and Enterprise immediately launched, launched a strike of both uh, dive bombers and uh, Avenger torpedo bombers. Um, the, the Japanese and the, the American uh, flight squadrons actually passed each other as they headed to attack the, each other's uh, task force. Uh -huh. And um, the Japanese came in on Hornet. They, they really one of the probably one of the most disciplined air attacks in, in uh, aviation history. What they call a hammer and anvil attack, where they they used the torpedo planes mm -hmm. and, and then the bombers and uh, so uh, on that on this occasion Hornet took a lot of uh, ordnance uh, she took some torpedo hits several um, bomb hits from uh, like 500 pound bombs under her flight deck where was your dad when some of this he, he was uh, he was up there on that tower in charge of the signalman and uh, there were a Japanese dive bomber pilot. We even actually know his name, Shigeyuki Sato. He was mortally wounded. He and dove on the Hornet with his bomb still attached. He crashed his plane into the signal bridge of the Hornet. While your dad was up there, he was about 20 feet away, and seven of his his men were showered in burning av, av gas. How far away were they from him? 20 about, feet? About 20 feet. And it did not get your dad? By the grace of God. It was not his day, he was, was it? He was shielded by a bulkhead uh, that prevented the av gas from covering over him. Him and his commander, Oscar Dodson, and some other men, they, they actually tried to throw these burning men down and, and, and extinguish them. But, they basically had 100% burns in seconds. And so seven of them perished, and mm. 29 others were, were, were wounded. But your dad survived that. He survived it. Uh, the Hornet took a terrible beating. Uh, they kept trying to tow it from the area, um, but the Japs kept coming back with um, you know, more dive bombers and more torpedo planes. She took a few more hits, and uh, so at some point they were told to abandon ship uh, late in the day, about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. The battle started in the morning, about 8 o'clock, mm -hmm. and by the end of the day, uh, they, they were told to abandon It was just too damaged to save. They, if they'd had time, they could have towed it back, but they were putting the other ships, Enterprise and the other ships, at risk. And so it, it, it didn't make sense to, uh, to continue. Did they scuttle it or did the Japanese sink it? Or a little bit of both? We attempted to scuttle it. Mm -hmm. I, I should note that while the Japanese were uh, attacking Hornet, Hornet's flyers attacked the Japanese aircraft carrier Shokaku. They planted uh, four 1,000 pound bombs on the flight deck of the Shokaku putting it out of the war for a year. Wow. Yeah. So in that respect, uh, you know, it was kind of almost an even trade. Yeah. Um, as far as Hornet, um, it was decided uh, that we would scuttle it. Uh, they fired um, torpedoes from our destroyers and several hundred rounds of um, five-inch shells into Hornet starting fires throughout the whole the whole superstructure, and it still wouldn't sink. 
to this day, they say that the Hornet took more ordnance than any ship in history and still refused to sink. Um, so in the end, uh, our ships had to leave the scene mm -hmm. and Japanese destroyers came upon it, fired a couple more torpedoes and she rolled over and sank yeah. in 17,000 feet of water. Wow. So your dad abandoned ship. Yeah, dude. What was that like? Well, he was one of the last off being a lookout signalman. He was among the last group off. And they climbed down a rope into the sea and uh, he had to he had to float in the sea for about 45 minutes and he was picked up by a destroyer. Most of the men were successfully picked up. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, Hornet only lost a little over a hundred men that day, which is and that amazing. includes those injured in the in the attacks hits. And, and and the aftermath. They, they lost, That's a miracle, isn't it? Uh, yeah, they, they they lost about 111 uh, mm -hmm. men that day, which is tragic. But there was 2,200 men on that ship. There were, yeah, yeah. and most of them survived and most were picked up by other ships in the area. Shark infested waters and all, and still most of them survived. Picked up by some destroyers. So, what happens? Well, they, they took them into New Amia, New Caledonia. And uh, while Dad was there, because on the Hornet, his day job, so to speak, was he was a, what they call a coxswain, which is the pilot of the small boats on Hornet. The little, the little boats that ran supplies and mm -hmm. stuff like that. That was his job. So, his next job was piloting landing craft in a, a salvage operation mm -hmm. there on New Amia, New Caledonia. He had just received orders uh, before the, the Battle of Santa Cruz to report to Pensacola to go to flight school. And uh, he, he was he excited got, about that. He got dumped in New Caledonia instead. <laughs> yeah, and the bad thing that happened was he caught malaria. While he was there? While he was in New Caledonia, ended up in the hospital at different times because the, the malaria would flare up mm -hmm. and uh, go in remission, so to mm -hmm. speak, and then it would flare up again. So he missed his opportunity to be a naval aviator, which mm -hmm. is what he always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, he spent the rest of the war as a training officer in um, both Miami and back in Pearl Harbor. So he let they, somehow he made it from the, the the Pacific Theater back to Pearl Harbor in Miami. The war's not over yet, though, right? Or is the no, war over? The, the, that, no, it was still he still had like three years to serve during World War II. Right. And he, but he did it as a training officer over on stateside. Stateside and yeah, in Pearl Harbor. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So that pretty much was the end of World War II for him. But it wasn't the end of his military career, was it? No, it wasn't. Uh, he, he got out of the Navy in, uh, in 1946, I think the beginning of 1946. You know, obviously we didn't need as many men in the military mm -hmm. as we had before. So he thought he was gonna try to do something, do something different and he got out, he made his way to Pensacola and he actually got hired civil service at Pensacola Naval Air Station. He uh, met my mom, Marjorie Logston. They got married, started a family Mm -hmm. But after a year, he, he, he missed the military. Mm -hmm. And they were forming the, the Air Force out of the Army Air Corps. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, what did they, so he joined the Air Force. And what they do? They put him in the Air Force's Navy. <laughs> Since he had those skills of uh, piloting uh, uh, boats, uh, the, they gave him some rank. And they made him, uh, first, first he was crew with some rank on uh, the crash boats. These were 85 foot crash rescue boats, you know, used to rescue downed flyers off the coast. Right, right. So he was stationed at Eglin Air Force Base. And, uh, and, and after uh, not too long, he, he received a promotion I think to staff staff sergeant. Yeah, and he was became a skipper of these crash boats. crash boats. Folks, aren't these uh, stories fascinating? I just I just love to hear them, 
And uh, uh, when this one goes up on our YouTube channel at Family Tree Nuts, uh, I'm going to be anxious to see your responses because I've got a feeling some of you have stories also, and I would like to hear about them. So uh, I look forward to hearing from you. This thing will go up in a week or two as soon as Russ gets it ready to go. But anyway, we're going to go back to Rob here and uh, finish talking about his dad. So he's, he's in the uh, Air Force now, the, Na the Air Force Navy. Yep. So he couldn't get away from the water, could he? No, and he, and he didn't mind. <laughs> for, for him, it was the perfect job. Yeah. And uh, these, these crash boats, they were, they were used all over the world. Um, they, he was sent to uh, Anna Weetok in the South Pacific, where they were doing the um, nuclear testing uh -huh. of atomic and hydrogen bombs. And they were sent there to uh, clear the range for, uh, for, this, for the bomb tests and also for rescue. Um, so this was a big deal, you know, this, mm -hmm. the, the, the atomic bomb testings mm -hmm. as we built um, bigger devices, mm -hmm. bigger, more explosive devices. Yeah. Did that pretty much wrap up his military career at that point? Uh, no, he, he actually, uh, he ended up uh, at Cape Canaveral on the crash boats. At, at That's varying, cool. At varying times, they were phasing out crash boats because helicopters were, were becoming uh, more, more usable, prevalent, yeah. bigger, more yeah. usable for rescue. So they were phasing out these crash boats, mm -hmm. which, like I said, were much like uh, the World War II PT boats. Right. Um, but at various times, they still needed them. So he, he, he changed duties. He was in Germany for a while uh, doing uh, communications type work. So this they is, gave him a whole new job. So over to Germany, yeah. which this would this be late 40s, early 50s? This would have been early 50s, late 40, 49 to, to 52. So a lot of reconstruction going on in Europe right then. Yeah, right. He's over in Germany. Right. And uh, so he was there for three years. Mom, uh, brother Mike, who uh, would have been uh, about four or five years old at this time. And uh, so this is when mom became pregnant with me. And he was transferred back to the States, back into the boats, and uh, to um, Cape Canaveral, where that's, you know, of course the space program was starting to heat up, mm -hmm. you know, with the satellites and the planned, future planned uh, manned mm -hmm. missions. missions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, John so Glenn, the, Mercury. <laughs> yeah. And so that was in the, this would have been uh, 52 to uh, about 58 right. th that he was stationed at the Cape. And not bad duty. No. Uh, you know, right here in, in Florida. Central Florida. We, we lived on Patrick Air Force Base. I was born there. Mm -hmm. And so he served right there at uh, Cape Canaveral, um, the Air Force Station right there. And they would, they would go out and clear the range of fishing boats and stuff when they were getting ready to have missile shots. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they also did uh, search and rescue for down flyers mm -hmm. and the like. And then he, Dad, uh, finished uh, the last three years of his Air Force career in England back in uh, communications. Um, again, they started to phase out the, the grass boats again. Right. And uh, so his, his Over to England for a few years. From 58 to 61. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to the first, second, and third grade in England. We were stationed at Skullthorpe and Lake and Heath Air Force bases. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 1961, Dad came home and uh, started his career at the uh, Postal Service and spent another 15 years. Postal Service where? Where was in, it? In Orlando. So he came to, Orla came to Central Florida, because yeah. you all had actually been living in Central Florida when he was stationed here at Cape Canaveral. Is that the reason why you think he came to Central Florida? Because it was familiar? Uh, somewhat, of course, he he, uh, he liked Florida for the weather. Sure. Mom liked it. Uh, she been, she was a Pensacola girl. Okay, so and, that's uh, home Orlando for her. Orlando was a growing area, and he thought it was a, a great place to uh, mm -hmm. raise his family. So he worked for the Postal Service in Orlando. Fifteen years at the Postal Service, re retired from there also. Yeah. So he had 35 years of service to his country, so to speak. What was it like growing up with him? It, it, it was awesome. He, Many of the men of his day were kind of stern men who, you know, didn't really 
necessarily show a lot of love and affection. Mm -hmm. He was not that guy. Really? He was unusual in that regard. Uh, I think it was because he was the youngest mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, of, the, of the nine children, and his older sisters kind of, uh, you know, they, they taught him a different way. Right. You know, the, 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 the older boys were gone and, and mm -hmm. doing their own thing. So you were the beneficiary of that. Uh, of that. <laughs> Was a, he was an unusually warm man. Uh -huh. He enjoyed coaching me in sports and mm -hmm. teaching me. And, and he was a lover of history. And he gave me a love of history. And uh, he went on in his later years to do a lot of uh, genealogy, mm -hmm. study and work. Uh, actually an enormous amount. Yeah. Uh, traveling the country, going to libraries. He went to a lot of reunions, right? For many years, he went to the Hornet reunions. Um, he, there was more than one Hornet. Uh, there was a, a, another one after that, another aircraft carrier, uh, to honor the Hornet CV-8. Right. And so they would do reunions together. And I'm sure he enjoyed CV that. Of. He did. He was a well-known figure there. Especially he, because of that picture. Being the, the guy in the photo, everybody knew Bob Logston. Yeah. And uh, so he was, uh, and he actually uh, helped facilitate some of those reunions, yeah. uh, especially in Pensacola. And uh, so, yeah, he was a well-known figure at yeah. those reunions. Wow, what a story. So how long did he live? My dad lived a good long life. He lived to almost age 91. He, he passed away November 16th in 2009. Mm -hmm. In February, he would have been 91 years old. So mm -hmm. he, he lived in a long, extraordinary life. He was at some of the biggest events of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to be his son. He, he was a wonderful, strong man of God. Mm -hmm. And a wonderful family man. Mm -hmm. A husband and father, grandfather. And proud to be his son. I'll tell you what, in this day and time, it's just uh, so important that we remember men like this who raised families like this and uh, that, that had traditional values and uh, were patriotic, were patriots, were heroes and willing to fight for our country. And it's just an honor to, to know Rob and to uh, hear about his family. And you can tell by the wealth of knowledge this man has in his head that uh, he knows a lot about it. He's read up a lot about it, especially since his dad was right in the middle of it. And I just want you to know that I really appreciate you taking the time to tell these stories because it's important to all of us and we appreciate the service that the Logston family has made for this country. Thank you, Scott. There, <laughs> there was a, obviously there was uh, millions of men that, that did some similar things and, and, and served. And uh, as Tom Brokaw said, they, they, they were the greatest generation. Yes, they were. And they were those guys that just did the right thing which is rare in this day and time. They were the right guys at the right, the right time. time. Did the right thing. Like I said, these stories are important to Russ and I and to Family Tree Nuts, and we know that they're important to you too. So uh, we appreciate you tuning in. Uh, there's more to come. And uh, subscribe if you haven't already. And just remember, Family Tree Nuts. Let our nuts find the nuts in your family tree. <laughs>